guys are ready. I want to talk to you today about your hands. Our hands are always with us, but they're often ignored and sometimes worse, shunned. How many of you had grandmothers who told you never to use your hands while you talk? You said so because if you use your hands while you talk, people are going to think you don't know what you're talking about. Now, it turns out Benjamin Franklin seems to have agreed with your grandmother. Benjamin Franklin said, the eye of the master will do more work than both his hands. Benjamin Franklin was a pretty smart guy. He brought us bifocals and electricity and the stove. But I'd like to suggest, on this point, Benjamin Franklin was wrong. Now, I'd like to talk about our hands not as uh, uh, things used to build things, but rather as things used to represent information. I want to talk about gesture, the way we use our hands when we talk. So what's a gesture? A gesture is a hand movement that does not have a direct effect on the world. Rather, it affects the world indirectly by representing information. Now, I'm certain that all of you think the kinds of gestures I'm going to be talking about are things like thumbs up, okay, or all those rude gestures that I'm not allowed to produce while being videotaped in Mandel Hall, but I'm not. That's not the kind of gesture I want to talk about. Those gestures you can produce right or you can produce wrong. So for example, if I do this with my middle finger, that's not the okay gesture. It really isn't. The kinds of gestures I want to talk about are spontaneous gestures, unwitting gestures. You can't be wrong with these gestures. Now, people often think those kinds of gestures are mere hand-waving. But I want to suggest, in fact, those gestures reflect what's on our minds. And to do so, I'm going to go back to an old paradigm used by Jean Piaget. What Piaget did was he showed children two rows of checkers, and he made sure the children thought that there were the same number of checkers in, in the two rows, and then he spread one of the rows out. And he said, OK, are there the same number of checkers in these two rows? Now, children under the age of seven say, no, they're different. And I'm interested in the reasons that they give for saying they're different. So here is a, a child who says they're different because you spreaded them apart. She says it with her mouth, and she also says it with her hands. Watch her. Maybe. Oh, let's try it again. Do these two rows of checkers have the same or a different number of checkers in them? Different. Which row has more checkers in it? This one. Why does it have more checkers in it? Because you spread them apart. <laughs> okay. So she's convinced they're different, and she says so with her hands in her mouth. Her hands are clearly conveying substantive information. So now let's compare this child um, to the other one. This one also thinks they're different. She's pretty sure they're different. And she says they're different because you moved them. Same kind of explanation. But watch her hands. What she does is something like this. That's pretty smart. She's sort of saying there's the same number of checkers. She's aligning the checkers in this row with the checkers in this row. Do these two rows of checkers have the same or a different number of checkers in them? A different number. Which row has more checkers in it? This one. Why does it have more checkers in it? Because you move them. So this child has produced what we've been calling a mismatch. She's saying something different with her hands, something substantive, but something different with her hands than she says with her mouth. When we saw kids like this, we thought maybe they know a little bit more than matching children, children who only produce matching gestures. And so what we did to find out is we gave them all instruction in conservation, and when we looked to see who would succeed on the task. Now what you see here is the proportion of children who got better after instruction. The blue bar are the mismatching children who are mismatching before instruction. The white bar are the children who are matchers before instruction. And what you can see is that the mismatchers were much more ready to learn than the matchers. So what this suggests is that our gestures really can convey substantive information, and it can even tell us who's ready to learn. But what I want to do, really, today, is to convince you that our hands not only reflect what we know, but it can change what we know, change your minds. And it can change it in two different ways. It can, the gestures that we see can change our minds, and the gestures that we do can change our minds. So let's look first at the gestures that we see. In order to look at the gestures that we see, we want to start to look at a math problem. So here's a pretty simple little math problem. Turns out most fourth graders in America get this problem wrong. They can't solve it. And when they can't solve it, they do make one of two errors. Either 
They add up all of the numbers in the problem, and they add up the 7, the 8, and the 5, and the 5, and they put 25 in the blank. Or they add up the numbers on the left side of the equation, and they put 7, 8, and 5, and they get 20, and they put that in the blank. But as we all know, I think, or I hope we all know, 15 <laughs> is the right answer. Okay, so what we did to try to figure out what gestures to teach kids and what words to teach kids is look at some teachers to see how they taught children this problem. So here is a teacher teaching a child an equalizer strategy. She basically says make both so sides equal. So we can add equal. 7 plus 8 plus 5, which equals 20. And then we want to make the other side of the equal sign the same amount. And so 15 plus 5 also equals 20. And so 15 will be the answer. Okay, that's a good strategy for teaching. Add, subtract. This is another one. Add up all the numbers on the left side and subtract the number on the right side. That's a good one, too. Here she goes. So we can add 7 plus 8 plus 5, which equals 20. We then subtract the other 5 from 20, and so 15 will be the answer. Okay, so those are two very good strategies. Some teachers use them on the same problem. And when they do, of course, not surprisingly, they have to do it sequentially. You can't say two things at once. But notice if you did one of those strategies in gesture, you could produce the two simultaneously. So here's the same teacher, and what she's doing is producing an equalizer strategy in speech, but she produces an add-subtract strategy in gesture. She points at the seven, the eight, and the five, and then she does a takeaway gesture next to the other five. So we can add seven plus eight plus five, which equals 20, and then we want to make the other side of the equal sign the same amount. So 15 plus 5 equals 20. So 15 will be the answer. Okay. So we wanted to see what happens when we give these kids words like that or gestures like that. So first we gave them the equalizer strategy, one strategy in speech. They all started at zero, so they got a little bit better. This is the number of correct after instruction. Then we gave them two strategies in speech to see what would happen. We thought that would be great. Turns out it's a terrible idea. Children do much worse with two strategies in speech than, in one, than with one strategy in speech. But here's the interesting data. So now I'm going to give them two strategies, one in gesture and one in speech, and look what happens. The kids are terrific. They're much better. They learn much better if you have the same information but in gesture and in speech. Okay, so I've been arguing here that gesture is really good for learning, as I just showed you. But what I really want to argue is that gesture is a powerful tool. It can be used for good, as I just showed you, or it can be used for evil. And now I'm going to show you an example of a way in which we used it for evil. And I'm going to go to the world of um, eyewitness testimony. Okay, so we all know we can mislead people by asking targeted questions. So if I say, what color was the hat he was wearing? All of a sudden, you're more likely to tell me that he was wearing a hat than if I didn't say that. But what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to ask an open-ended question. You're supposed to say, what else was he wearing? Okay, so what Sarah Broders, who's pictured in that videotape, and I did, was we brought a musician, we sent a musician into children's classrooms, and then we interviewed the children over a series of weeks to find out what they'd witnessed. So, here is one child being interviewed. All you need to know in listening to this is that the musician was not wearing a hat. Okay, here we go. Okay, what else was he wearing? Um, a music hat. A music hat? Was he wearing anything else that you can remember? Yes. Yeah? A green hat. A green hat? Oh. A queen hat. A queen hat? And a cowboy hat, too. Okay, and a cowboy hat, too. Where did all the hats come from? I don't know if you noticed whether you were watching carefully, but let's watch Sarah again. She asked a perfect open-ended question, but watch your hands. Okay, what else was he wearing? She did a hat gesture along with it. We got just as many hat responses when she said, what else was he wearing, as when we said, what color was the hat he was wearing. Gesture can lead you astray. Okay, so I've talked about how gestures, the gestures of others can have an impact. Now let's look at the gestures that you yourself produce. Now, I've already suggested the gestures you produce reflect what's on your mind. But in order to argue that the gestures you produce can change what's on your mind, I have to manipulate gesture, force you to do gestures. Okay, so, actually, we don't force anybody. We only encourage people to gesture. So, so what we did was, again, we looked at this math problem, and we encouraged children to produce words. This is the first set of children. They were told to produce the equalizer strategies, parrot these words every time they solved the problem. 
Okay, first of all, can you say the words exactly like we practiced? I want to make one side equal to the other side. Okay, and then can you write your answer? Okay, here's another child told to say exactly the same words, but she was told to produce this kind of gesture, to produce a grouping gesture. She does a V under the two and the four, grouping them together to add them, and then a point at the blank. That solves the problem. Okay, now can you say those words and do those hand movements for me? I want to make one side equal to the other side. Okay, now can you write your answer? Okay, and the third group, they're the same words, same grouping gesture, but under the wrong numbers. Put a V under the four and the nine, and then point at the blank. Well, first of all, can you say those words and do those hand movements exactly like we practiced? I want you to make one side equal to the other side. Okay, now can you write okay so what happens? This is the number of problems that the children got correct after instruction. They were all at zero initially. You can see, remember, they all said the same things, but it's the kids who produced the fully correct grouping strategy who did best, followed by the kids who produced this partially correct strategy in gesture, followed by children who produced no gestures at all. So this is nice. We can, if we know what to tell children to do with their hands, we can make them learn or help them learn better by having them move their hands in particular ways. But if you really want to go into the classroom, sometimes we don't know what to tell children to do with their hands. So in that case, we might just want to increase learning by telling children to move their hands any which way at all. So that's what we did next. We told children to solve a problem, and then we said, okay, now the next time you solve this problem, I want you to move your hands when you're explaining it. So here's a child who solved the problem for the second time, incorrectly still, she added up all the numbers in the problem. She said she added up all the numbers in the problem, but watch her hands. With her hands, she's doing an add-subtract gesture. She points to the three, sorry, the two, the four, and the five, and then she does a takeaway gesture on the other five. Okay, can you tell me how you got 16 here as your answer? Well, I added 2 and 4 and 5 and 5 and got 16 as my answer. Okay, so what this suggests is that children often know more than they can say. But what's really interesting is that we can get them to activate this knowledge just by telling them to move their hands. And so now the interesting question is whether or not this activating of this knowledge makes them ready to learn. And the answer to that question is yes. And we did that, we figured that out by giving all of these children instruction. And what we found is that children who were told to gesture were much more likely to learn than children who were told not to gesture. So what we found here is that we can encourage children to learn um, by just encouraging them to move their hands. So I've talked about gesturing and learning in a very constrained experimental situation. Now I want to suggest that gesturing can be used to solve real world problems. Not world peace, mind you, but something important nonetheless. So we all know that children um, who, from lower income homes come to school less prepared, less ready than children from higher income homes. They have, in particular, smaller vocabularies. And it can't be the number of zeros on their tax returns that's creating this difference. It's got to be something behavioral. It's got to be something that's happening in the home. So what's happening in the home? We know, also, that in high-income homes, there's more talk. People talk more. Parents talk more, kids talk more. But what we've discovered, actually, is that if you hold talk constant, we also find that people gesture more in high-income homes. The other thing we've discovered is that the way in which you gesture when you're a little kid predicts the size of your vocabulary several years later. So, the number of gestures that you produce at 14 months, actually, if you produce more gestures when you're 14 months old, you're likely to have a bigger vocabulary 54 months than if you produce fewer gestures. So, that's a nice fact. It's a nice, perhaps, mere correlation. The question is whether or not gesture isn't just mirroring, just giving us a, an image of what's to come, but maybe gesture is actually playing a role in what's to come. So to find out, once again, we have to encourage children to gesture. So this is the way we did that. And look at the truck. Can you do this? That's a truck. Yay! Good job. Okay. Oh, she's enthusiastic. We, we, we showered them with enthusiasm. But basically, we told them to put their finger on a picture. So what happens? When you tell them to put their finger on a picture, they do it. They're good kids. They complied. So children who were told to put their fingers on a picture gestured more with the experimenter 
than children who are not told to put their fingers on a picture. No big surprise. But the, this was an eight-week study. And over the eight weeks, we looked at how often the children gestured when they were with their parents. And what we found is that the children who were encouraged to gesture with the experimenter also started gesturing with their parents. They had really become gesturers. They'd started to use gestures with their parents. And now here's the payoff. At the end of this eight-week study, we also found that those children who are now had become gesturers produce more words when they're interacting with their parents than children who were not told to gesture. So we've done this study now with middle-class homes and upper-class homes. Now what we're trying to do is to do it into lower-class homes where we think the payoff might be actually bigger because the rate of gesturing is lower. We might think that we can really encourage children and parents to gesture more, which might then have an impact on their vocabulary several years later, which might make them better prepared for school. Okay, so what I hope I've done is convinced you that Benjamin Franklin was wrong on this one. That gesture is a really important part of our communication. It tells us not only what's on someone's mind, but it can also play a role in changing that mind. And I want to suggest, in fact, that face-to-face -face communication shouldn't be diminished, that face-to-face -face communication is important and perhaps shouldn't go out of fashion. And in fact, um, what I would like to do is to suggest that Carl Jung really had it right when he said, often the hands will solve a mystery that the intellect has struggled with in vain. Or, if you prefer Andy Rooney, don't rule out working with your hands. It does not preclude using your head. So what I'd like to do now is just thank you for listening, and more importantly, thank you for watching my hands. <laughs>